Pentecost and Pentecostal living and summer encounters. We're going to be uh, taking this season and this time to go to the book of Romans, uh, the book of Romans, and uh, dig in a little bit about um, this whole uh, effort of what does it mean to live in light of God's spirit at work in our lives. Certainly the book of Romans is uh, a powerful and a most uh, critical and important uh, text. It is uh, arguably uh, one of the most uh, systematic theological texts we have. Uh, it has certainly uh, been understood to have been written by Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, the, the one who started out kind of a thug, praise God. Amen. Paul was, Paul was one, he spoke around here, you know, beating up folk and killing folk and coming after folk. And and, and, and he ran into somebody he couldn't kill. Amen. And uh, how many knows there is always someone greater than you? Uh, turn you all the way around. Amen. Anybody ever met somebody thought they was the baddest joker on the corner, on the block? Amen. And then they ran into somebody that was a little bit, a little bit more tough. And they realized, hmm, well, I think I need to make a little bit of change. That's what Paul, Paul saw. Paul, he ran into Jesus. Amen. And uh, Jesus made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Amen. Kind of like the Godfather. Any Godfather fans in the house? Amen. Just a few. Okay. Thank God. All right. So anyhow, uh, Paul is uh, thought to have been the author of this of this text of this book. Uh, it is a letter to the church in Rome, and uh, I love how some uh, folks describe. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the kind of, uh, say, historical eyewitness accounts of the gospel of Jesus, and, and Romans is the theological account of the gospel of Jesus. In the book of Romans, you find all these very rich concepts that uh, become either redefined or re-articulated uh, in light of the gospel of Jesus, concepts of sin and grace and the law and the spirit. Uh, you find, you know, Jesus being described as uh, the one who undid the great error of Adam uh, in uh, the beginning, where Adam sinned, and because of Adam's sin, one person sinned, if you will, uh, death entered into the world, and, and so Jesus was able to undo that, that error or that rebellious act of Adam, and through one person's obedience, there we say Jesus' obedience, life entered into the world. Very rich concept in the book of Romans. And so I think we did a little bit of a, of a, a few months long Bible study um, in Romans uh, earlier this year. And it was so rich, I think we only got to chapter two. Amen. After what? Six, seven weeks. It touched your name. Amen. So I guess next time we got the plan a little better. Amen. And <laughs> rather than six to eight weeks, we'll do a year long study on the book of Romans. Maybe we'll get to Romans chapter eight by the end of the. All right. Here we go. Romans chapter seven. Then is where we'll spend uh, our time today. Uh, let, let's, let's see what, what, what the word of God speaks to us. Romans chapter 7, verse number 14. The word of God uh, says this. Oh, and I'm reading from the message translation. So it may read a little bit different, but uh, it's, all, it's all, I think, communicating quite the same thing. I can't anticipate the response that is coming, Paul is saying that I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I am not. Isn't this also your experience? Just off the gate, you know, I think it's cool that Paul, particularly in this passage, is uh, giving you and I the freedom to not lie to ourselves while we're in church, amen? Maybe even while we're not in church, but let's start with telling the truth while we're here and maybe it'll flow outside when we leave. Paul continues to say, yes, I'm full of myself. Touch your neighbor. Amen. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I'm full of myself. It's okay. Just, I am full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another doing things I absolutely despise. 
So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. Verse number 17. But I need something more. For if I know the law, but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. Somebody holler, help me, Lord. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. Paul's speaking a lot of truth up in here, amen. Uh, I'm reading this just sweating myself. <laughs> My decisions such as they are don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me. And it gets the better of me every time. Verse 21. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. <laughs> it's the realest thing y'all read all week long, ain't it? I mean, y'all, some of y'all sitting here just, I didn't know the Bible could be so real. <laughs> some of y'all are like, give me the King James version back where I, I didn't understand what they was talking about. Uh. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Happens so already that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel. And just when I Least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind but am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. Chapter 8, verse 1. With the arrival of Jesus the Messiah, that faithful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying death cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. That is the word of God. For us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk a little bit today about the inside-outside game. Inside-outside game. Bow your heads with me and uh, let us ask God to be present with us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. Please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Inside, outside game. Now, I am one of these folks who not only is a sports fan and Y'all know that a lot of the work that we do in our justice work is um, also uh, central to the way in which we see and understand and try to make sense of our calling to follow Jesus in a world that is clearly uh, anti-Christ. And, and so I, 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 I was thinking of how to really have this 
conversation with us today about sin, because that's kind of what we're going to talk about a little bit today. Sin, sinny, sin, sin. Uh, because I think uh, if we are going to be filled with God's spirit, it's also important for us to be clear about that which we must resist and, dare I say, empty from us as much as we can. And so I thought of this whole concept of the inside-outside game because I realized that there are often moments in our work life, you see this in sports life, you see this in your spiritual lives, you see this maybe in your own individual life where there are things that are going on inside of us or inside of a thing that are often out of alignment with that which is going on on the outside. You know, when we go up into uh, the halls of Congress or the city halls or the governors or the governors or the state legislature, if you will, we're always aware that there is a inside game that some folk have to play while they are participating in these systems. And then there's an outside game that some of us have to play in order for us to reach a uh, maximum impact. And that often things can break down pretty quickly when only the inside game is working to your advantage and the outside game is totally out of coordination. Or you could find yourself a little bit stonewalled if the inside game has another agenda. And the outside game is operating with a certain kind of set of priorities that are oppositional, if you will, to what those who are engaging in the inside game or strategy in this whole kind of setup. When you take a look at some of the most powerful, at least basketball, kind of teams that have had great success, you've often had to have somebody who you could secure the middle and have an inside game. You know, I, my, I'm glad the Warriors are, are winning finally, amen, after 40 years of being alive in the Bay Area. So, you know, because I grew up, you know, watching Magic Johnson and, you know, all these folk win, like, you know, five, six times in a, the whole era of my adolescence. You know, I just was a Magic Johnson fan and, 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 and then, you know, made me become a Laker fan. And, and then, you know, Kobe and Shaq came and, you know, kind of resurrected that whole dynastic, uh, you know, they, they, they pretty, they're pretty terrible right now. And so, we going to go for the home team, amen, while they winning, praise God. So they got about four more years probably worth the championship rings. And then by that time, the Lakers should be back to full strength. And... <laughs> Somebody say amen, amen, amen. But, 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 but what I learned from watching 20 years of dominance by the Lakers in the 80s and 90s, maybe even the 2000s, was that they were always at their best because they had an inside game. Kareem, Abdul-Jabbar, seven foot, are the greatest player who ever played the game. At least, you know, we know that he's the greatest scorer, more MVPs than, you know, more championships than, than most. But he had this, this sky hook. Some of y'all don't know nothing about that. You should use YouTube. And just look at his, the beauty of the sky hook. I know Brother Bill knows about that. <laughs> Unstoppable inside game. That when everything stalled from the outside, all they had to do was dump it in the cap. It was his nickname. The captain. Clay Abdul-Jabbar. All you do, <laughs> money. They run down the court, play defense. He'd be there, block the other team because his inside presence was so strong. Magic would take the pass, Worthy on one side, 
Byron Scott, Michael Cooper, and they just gone. Woo! Nine out of 12 years in the NBA Finals with that formula. Somebody say inside game, outside game. They're pretty, pretty hard to beat. Then you had Shaq and Kobe, and they had their season of dominance, amen? Because they couldn't get along, though. They had the inside game, and they had the outside game, but because they could not get along, rather than have a 10-year run of dominance like Magic and Kareem before them, they only really had about a five-year. Won three out of five championships. And then he went somewhere else and became a scrub, amen, and Kobe <laughs> had to find a lesser replacement, amen, and got Pal Gasol and Andrew Bynum, and not certainly as powerful as Shaq, but, you know, they ended up winning two out of three more champions. I think one against the Boston Celtics. Another one, amen. So I'm just trying to help you understand that... The lessons of some of this sports stuff, if you a fan, will help you to see that when you have an inside game that is in coordination with the outside game, you become an unstoppable force. And it is no mystery then to me why we are having such a terrible time as the Church of Jesus Christ in this season. Because our inside game is not in coordination with our outside game. And clearly, to me, you know, the failure is not in our coach, or dare I say, the one who has chosen us, drafted us, put us in certain positions, given us the ability and the power to achieve all that we have been called to do. But there seems to be a lack of coordination and alignment, if you will, between that which is going on on the inside of us and that which is being expressed on the outside. There was an old song we used to sing growing up. I was singing all these old songs this morning. Uh, my, 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 my mom's voice was in my mind this, 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 this morning. She used to sing a song. This is not a song for, for my sermon. It was another song that she used to sing. And it would say, one day, one day, I'm going where Jesus is. One day, one day, I'm going where Jesus is. We'll be caught up to meet him in the air. Caught up to meet him. Caught up to meet him. Joy and happiness will be mine. I was walking around the house singing that song. I think my daughter's like, Daddy, what are you, what is, what are you talking about? <laughs> Couldn't understand what I was talking about. Woo, I'm becoming a little older than I thought. Amen. Walk around house singing old songs. There is another old song that we sing, and it says something on the inside. Working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Then, you know, like old black church songs do, you could just substitute any kind of word. <laughs> Sing the same song for an hour, boy, till, till the thing became real to you. Amen. Now, you know, we get tired. Like, we just said that verse last, like, you know, there's something else we can say. So we say, but, you know, back then it was just repetition, almost like a way to just convince your mind. Well, you know, that's how we, we made it through. Some of us need to go back and grab them practices. So there's something on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Oh, what a change in my life. Is it Jesus on the inside? Working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Jesus on the inside, we're on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Oh, what a change in my life. And it got real good. We said, the Holy Ghost on the inside. <laughs> Working on it. <laughs> I had 
Maybe you might know a little bit about some of that, hey, amen. I don't know if I'm just up here going through a nostalgic crisis. <laughs> but how many of you know there's a battle for the alignment of your inside and your outside? There's a battle now. I mean, there's a lot at stake when our inside is not in alignment with our outside. And we can talk about the inside in all kinds of ways. Today, I think the text helps us to at least be mindful that there is a struggle that is within us that requires our attention if we are going to demonstrate the power of God outside of us. See, often I fear that the Church of Jesus Christ in the West, certainly in the United States, certainly in this moment, is often hyperly focused on one or the other. And because of our inability to have the discipline and honesty to hold both in tension with one another, we are less powerful than we are called to be in this moment. And it is, of course, the case that when you are out of alignment, your expression of either yourself or your faith or your passion can be very schizophrenic, if I can use that word, or dissonant, or, or, or in the text, contradictory. And send a whole lot of mixed messages. Not just to other folk, but to yourself. I mean, ain't it something that, you know, because of social media, we all got all kinds of places to hide as a way to mediate our voice and our person. We got an avatar on Facebook, a profile on Instagram, a Snapchat, a Twitter. Uh, and it goes on, on, and on, and on, and on, and on. And, you know, we talk about, I think we call them like Twitter activists, Twitter thugs, Twitter warriors. People say stuff on Twitter that they know they would never say in person. I mean, I remember. I remember when MySpace first came out, I used to, because, you know, I used to be one of the people, you know, so captivated by the whole thing. Not even MySpace, it still happens right now. Like, you go to, like, I don't know, World Star, you go anywhere, and you start reading the comment sections. Or just go to the Chronicle, or just, just read the comment. You, Berkeley side, the most progressive place in the world. And folk are quick to call you the N-word, the... The, the, the B word, the, 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 the T word, you know, the thug word, you know, the, you know, folk just quick to be so mean when they hide in behind a keyboard. And it's created such a coarseness in our ability to see the humanity in one another because it's easy to hide yo inside. But how many know you can't hide it when it starts to seep out through your pores? Anybody ever been around somebody? Amen. Uh, you know, it's trying to act as if they weren't, you know, imbibing of those spirits. And, you know, they, 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 they get so much liquor in their system that it just, just emanates like cologne. You get around folk, man, you've been drinking. No, no. Or, or maybe you were outside, you know, I do this with the kids all the time. Mason Nancy here, man, we used to work at the school and they go out on lunch break and come back giving a contact high to everybody. Were you smoking during lunch? No, <coughs> no, no, <coughs> no, no. I'm just like, wait a second. Something's betraying you right now. And so part of what I think is so important for you and I to kind of sit with and sit in for these few moments is 
How do we win the battle for the inside-outside alignment? Now, Paul is certainly someone whose anthropology and that formed his theology is coming more from a Jewish perspective because Paul was a Jew. He was raised and trained as a as a teacher of the law. He was a he was according to his own testimony, trained by the greatest rabbis of his day. So Paul had a kind of dualistic uh, anthropology of body and spirit. And he, you know, kind of bought into a certain way of, of imagining how the body and the human were composed and the work and the reality and the activity of God was, in his mind, often mediated through this particular dualism. And so part of what I think is so important when we talk about the inside-outside game, particularly as we read Paul, particularly as we read Romans 7, is that Paul is attempting to play on this continued dualism of the law and the spirit. Of, if you keep reading in 8, the flesh and the spirit. This idea that there are two parts of us that are constantly in a tug of war and that our responsibility as followers of Jesus is to not run away from the struggle by lying to ourselves and saying we don't have one. Mm. Help me, Holy Ghost. How many know there ain't nothing worse than people who are in denial? I mean, you know... Uh, and often, most of the folk who are in denial don't believe they in denial. So they deny their own denial. I'll let that just sit with you, amen. You just pray about that this week. One of the ways that I believe Scripture is pulling us into a alignment of our inside, outside, dare I say, the, the, the ways in which we win the battle of the inside, outside, is that we must be people who are committed to continuous conversions. First thing, somebody say continuous conversions. Now, last week, I didn't get a chance to spend a whole lot of time on this point of moving from glory to glory. Because, you know, time ran out. Hopefully, it won't run out today. Man, I'm going to try to pick up the pace a little bit here because I, I love to give you all all of this and and, 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 and allow it to, to, to bless you throughout the week. How many of you know there is in your spiritual journey, your walk with Christ, a continuity of conversions that we all must be open to or we will get stuck in a rut? And like I said last week, surround ourselves with people only who look like us who are comfortable with our wickedness and sin and never speak truthfully to us about how we must be transformed. And, you know, we talked last week, it was a little bit of a joke for some, a little bit frightening for others about how when you get into a house of mirrors and you start to see yourself only surrounding you that you kind of get a little bit. And the house of mirrors creates a house of horrors that if you and I do not embrace this idea of continual conversions of our spirit, of our mind, of our heart, of our persons, that we will get locked into a place that was only intended to be a rest stop. You might have been on a long trip, amen. You know, some of y'all been here at the way a while. You probably heard me say this a few times, but you you're on a long trip to go somewhere and 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 you 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 get tired, so you pull into a rest stop. But wouldn't it be kind of strange if when you pulled into a rest stop, somebody had pitched a tent or tried to have their vacation at the rest stop? <laughs> like a second. This is not intended to hold you for longer, maybe a few minutes. I 
don't know about hours, because there's usually only a bathroom and maybe some grass. Ain't no food. Maybe a water fountain. I don't go in rest stops. I just keep driving, because I'm trying to get off the road when I get on the road. Except when I'm traveling with my family, man. They just got to go to the bathroom every 10 minutes. So I like traveling at night. Y'all going to go to sleep. By the time when you wake up, we where we need to be. Touch your name, amen. Mm, but 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 other folk, you know, use the rest stops. Wouldn't it be strange for you to be trying to live at a rest stop? How many know when you stop having continuous conversions in your walk with Jesus, it's like you're living at a rest stop? And sometimes that rest stop could be a terrible place. A temporary stop that you turn into a permanent residence becomes that which keeps the inside and the outside of your formation out of sync. And I want to submit to you, dear loved ones, that as the scripture says, you and I have to realize that we need help. We have to be honest and say, I realize that I don't have what it takes. Now, the worst thing for a Christian to do is lose their ability to tell God, I need your help. And I don't have what it takes. And, and depending on what tradition you come out of, we were talking about this during our uh, senior leadership team meeting. Or was that senior leadership? What's that thing called? LTI. Sorry, thinking of my job. SLT, LTI, TLC. Amen. <laughs> All of them are leadership acronyms. So y'all just forgive me. I just don't know where I'd be at half the time. But we were talking about how you can be in a certain tradition, and depending on the emphasis of your tradition, you can kind of uh, essentialize the whole of your spiritual development with only one particular trajectory. So I just pulled Baptists and Methodists out because these are kind of some of the major traditions that inform some of the larger Pentecostal denominations or Pentecostal spiritualities. But if you were uh, uh, kind of coming out of a Baptist tradition, you often had your most emphasis on the point of baptism and confession because it was intended to be that first work of grace, right? This idea that you must confess and be baptized and you shall be saved. And that first work that was done, I often call that a vertical conversion, right? That conversion between God and you. You changed your mind and your life and your heart and you said, I'm going to follow God. And then if you kind of come out of a Methodist tradition, you know, John Wesley and the Methodist, Charles Wesley, you know, folk, you know, who were in England that kind of helped to create this, 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 this methodical or systematic spiritual formation moved by the Holy Spirit. Most folk don't understand it. You know, you know, if you read Pentecostal history and theology, a lot of us kind of would attribute some of these, these ideas around holiness and Pentecostalism to the Wesley boy. You know, Wesley said things like, you know, our hearts were strangely warmed within us. And we engaged in unceasing prayer and praise. It sounds kind of Pentecostal to me, praise God. Amen. I ever had a strangely warmed heart? Amen. Something on the inside. <laughs> kind of little, got, lit you up a little bit. Like, whoo, I can't hold it together. Jeremiah said a little bit like that. It was like fire shut up in my bones. It's trying to give y'all... Some hooks to hang this stuff on, amen. But the Wesleys also talked about how holiness within is inadequate unless you have social holiness. So unless there was holiness in the community, right action, ordered systems that didn't prey on the poor. They had admonitions against gambling, I don't know if it's because they thought gambling was an inherently evil thing, but as pastors, they were tired of paying the rent for the women who would come to their church because their husband's out here drinking and gambling away all the money. 
So they put in a prohibition against gambling. Hello, somebody. Methodist. But in the Methodist theological kind of trajectory, there's this idea around called the second work of grace. So you have the Baptist, the first work of grace, baptism and confession. Hallelujah, we do that. But the Methodists also introduced this idea of the second work of grace, which is about our sanctification, that there is more work to be done in us. And that is what I kind of will kind of package to us as a horizontal conversion. Are you following me this morning? Amen. When we're talking about our ability to align the inside and outside game of our person and our communities, I want to argue that we as the church have to be committed to both the vertical conversions that happen between us and the almighty one true living God. And we have to be open to the horizontal conversions that are about us having the sin wickedness and rebellious tendencies and ways in our lives and the systems around us to be called into subjection under the power of God's spirit and God's ways. Continuous conversions. And I, you know, believe that for many of us, we are so against or resistant to a conversion experience that God will often push you to the edge of your mind, the edge of your threshold, for you to have to be like, okay, God, I've had enough. Help me! And that's what Paul is writing in this, in this chapter. How can I, who love God and love the ways of God, have inside me the desire to do God's will, but I can't do it? The things that I don't want to do, I do. And the things I do want to do, I don't do. Paul is expressing, I think, very powerfully the need for you and I to have this inside and outside game deeply informed by our continuous conversions. Let me get to this first set of questions then. What, or rather, have you made a vertical conversion to the ways of Jesus? The first question I will lift up to us, we who are serious about the inside and outside alignment of our purpose and our passion and God's call in our life. And then the second thing I will say to you and I, what horizontal conversions must you make to win the inside outside battles that you face? Y'all follow me on this. Amen. You follow me? Have you made the horizontal, the vertical conversion? That means have you first said, God, I'm a sinner and I need you. If you haven't done that yet, then you kind of got a little first work to do. And then after we do that, we still have some second work to do. Can I get a third and a fourth and a fifth works? Amen. Tell your neighbor, you got some work to do. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing. Tell your neighbor, put in some work this week now. What does it mean to get the vertical conversion moving and the horizontal conversion moving so we can have continuous conversions to the ways of Jesus? Hmm. Second thing that I think this text lift up, if we're going to align the inside and the outside game, is that we have to overcome the internal struggles. Somebody say overcome. Internal struggles. So I am certainly uh, very aware that often uh, we can situate sin as a radically personalized thing that happens on the inside of us. But you know, if you've been here at the way any long period of time, that I and we also believe in sin outside of us as well. There's this uh, theologian, Simon Chan, that I love. I've read his stuff over and over again through the years. And he describes sin in three ways. He says that there is the sin uh, within us. There is the sin around us. And there is the sin beyond us. 
So when we talk about sin, I mean, I think they have it up there. Oh, look, they do. Simon Chan. Hey, Doc. Amen. When we talk about sin, often we'll talk about the list of things that we personally or others personally struggle with. And isn't it interesting that you are often, I am too, often an expert on everybody else's list of sin. It's like, oh. You can diagnose it from a mile away. You don't got to know their name. Don't got to know their story. Don't got to know their journey. But you sure enough can know they sin. That's so funny. Snoop putting out a new record. Uh, somebody put it on Facebook. Uh, he putting out a gospel record, and and and, and, and it was it was it was it was a trip because the response was like, "I'm just viewed just right now." <laughs> third of people saying, "No, no, no." Another third be like, "Yes, yes, yes." And the other third was like, "Snoop." Everybody had an expert opinion about what Snoop should do with this gospel record. And Snoop, he had this funny video while he's playing the track in the back. And the track is the kind of hot track. It was what, our, what, what folks we know. He just, yeah, hey, I'm blessed. He just, he just got it. And I was like, all right, that's probably going to be a dope track for sure. <laughs> Woo. But. It's so fascinating that one of the one of the comments in there talked about. So what's gonna happen when you know <laughs> who's gonna lead the, the 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 weed smokers that Snoop is uh, influencing to the sinner's prayer? It's like one of the comments they wrote. And I you know don't mean to be dismissive of people. I clicked on there. Page and they had 25 friends. I said, it won't be you, praise God. You don't, you don't know nobody. Amen. You just, it's just fascinating. It was fascinating how, you know, folk got all these comments about things, and it's like your own influence is quite small. Mm, at least if you measure it by social media. Let me get off that because I feel like I went on a little bit of a tangent. But my, my, my whole point is that, you know, we can get so caught up in other people's struggles or lives or what we think is visible sin that we neglect our own. Mm -hmm. Our own internal struggle. How many know it's easier to, to, to help critique and speak on other people's struggle than it is to speak on your own. And you know yourself better than you know the person next to you. At least I hope you do. You know how hard it is for you to do the will of God. You know how hard it is for you to obey. You know how hard it is for you to say I'm sorry. You know how hard it is for you to love and to, to be peaceful and, and to forgive. You know yourself. Yet when you get next to somebody who's obviously doing something that you think is a sin, boy, that grace that has been afforded to you seems to be absent. I'm here to tell you now that some of us, dare I say all of us in this moment, have to start to pay attention to the internal struggles that we are called to overcome. Unless you think all I'm talking about is sex. Because that's what most folks think. The only thing Jesus cares about is sex. I mean, sex is not a small thing. And one day we'll have a, a, a real mature conversation about sex in the church. Because it is quite important for you to make sure that your body is not being given to any and everything in body when it is supposed to be consecrated and set apart for the use of the one who created you. Now, there's a lot of little consequences that happen when you, yeah, you say it. I mean, I wouldn't need to be crass. Say you lay down with dogs and you get what? Now, I don't know whose fault it is. Is it the dog's fault that the dog got fleas or Joe's fault that you lay down with the dog? I don't know. We talk about that later. But the consequence is the same. How many of you 
know, when you don't do things God's way, consequences come. And we can talk about what God's way is, because, you know, what some folks think is God's ways, other folks think it's not. But you should still be clear, dear loved ones, that there is a way that seems right to us. But the end is destruction. And right now, if you and I be serious about what is going on in the church, we got problems around sin. Relational sin. The way we relate to one another. I tell folk, if you're so caught up in sexual sins of people, why are you not caught up in the racial sins? Or the patriarchal sins? Or the misogynist sins? Or the abusive sins? Or the economic sins? I mean, you caught up in the sexual sins. God bless you now. I'm not trying to minimize any of it. But there's a whole lot of other sins that the church is falling down in our witness in this moment. And you got folk who will wish violence and death on someone else. <laughs> will we'll deliver violence and death. Christians now on another Christian because of who they voted for, because of their race, because of their gender, because of their orientation, because of their, 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 their uh, country of origin, or even their religion. And you got church folk Christians, so-called followers of Jesus, who are comfortable advocating for war and violence. You got Christians in marriages who are Hitting one another. Abusing one another. But you want to talk about sexual sin. That's all you want to talk about all day, every day. I'm just trying to. I'm just, three kinds of sins now. I'm not telling you not to be concerned about some of these things, but. We as the church have to become much more clear about the ways in which all of these things work. Jay-Z just put out this record. Everybody's loving Jay-Z's record. Four, four, is it 444? How you say his name? 444? I'd be like, four, four, four. Be like, that's not how you say it, Pastor Mike. <laughs> I mean, it's just like a scripture. When you say, like, you sound like Trump in the, what do you say? I can't remember what he said. Like, he never read a scripture before. Two Corinthians, right? <laughs> Two Corinthians. <laughs> Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 444. That's kind of how I sound it. Jay Z 444. No, 444. All right, I know. <laughs> and I'm just so fascinated by all the, 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 the pieces that are being written. You got the sisters that I know who I love and adore. They help bring me into consciousness about my misogyny and patriarchy. And I thank God for the sisters who helped me get, get, get sharpened on that. Because I don't want to cause no harm to the women I love. I mean, no, it don't matter if you intend to or not. If I step on your foot, it's going to hurt just the same if I meant to or if I didn't. I didn't mean to. Well, my foot still hurts, man. Please say you're sorry. Please stop stepping on my... I don't mean to keep stepping on your foot. That's no, no, no. Just stop. Give me a high five and tell them stop, 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 stop. The sister's response to Jay-Z's obvious, I haven't listened to the record because, you know, I didn't want to spend no money on it, praise God, but I'm eventually waiting for it to get on YouTube and then I'll just <laughs> press play. But I am captivated by the responses, Re listening and capturing his record. We're actually going to have a whole forum conversation about this record here at The Way probably in a couple weeks. Dr. Tiffany Johnson is going to get a few folk, Davey D, and, and maybe Mr. Fabulous, and a few other folk. We're going to have a conversation about black excellence versus black capitalism, which is one of the responses of his record. I read, you know, it's like, you know, he said in his record about how black folks just need to become more like Jewish folk who own all the property. Of course, you know, some terrible kind of, you know, stereotypes that work in there. But it seems to suggest that the key to black liberation is the accumulation of more stuff. And that kind of seems to 
be a problem because getting more stuff, you know, we in Ferguson, Michael Brown's anniversary is coming up, you know, and they, they said that, you know, things that would stop young people being shot dead in the streets, they had a mentor. The father was involved. They had an education. Mike Brown had all three. We had money to buy a house in Berkeley, but they wouldn't sell us a house in Berkeley. That's why we had to move to Oakland. You know, they had FHA loans, and we were told that, you know, if you have FHA loan, they don't like to put families of color in it with FHA loans into these homes because they bring the property values down. Kind of what my realtor told me. I didn't make it up. She told me that. I said, well, ain't that about something? So the first house we put our offer in on in Oakland, we got the house. Let's try to figure out if my credit and money's good in Oakland, why it ain't good in Berkeley? That, I had a mentor, had a job, had some money. That, 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 that formula didn't seem to work well for me, right? You know, another sister wrote about, you know, obviously Jay-Z had his little, you know, his, his great kind of maturation process, so it seems. And one of the sisters wrote a great piece about, what about all of us women who are left as roadkill on the journey for men to become good men? And I said, Lord Jesus. And I started looking in my rearview mirror like... <laughs> Help me, Holy Ghost. Amen. I, no, 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 I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry. Amen, brothers. You know what I'm talking about now. Some of you brothers got real tight, like straightforward. You the most focused you be in all day. He's like, Zzz. Zzz. how many know that what we believe will greatly inform how we live. If we're talking about living free, but we are investing in systems and practices that guarantee our bondage, you will not have your inside or outside game aligned. If you are in denial about the sin, your sin, that easily distracts or knocks you off course, you will often be subject to a lot of roadblocks, inconsistencies, and detours. And so part of what I want to submit to you, dear loved ones, is that you and I have to continue to be committed to overcoming the internal struggles that we often leave unaddressed because we are too fixated on everyone else's stuff or the sin around us or the sin beyond us. I want you to understand that sin is about your rebellious, our rebellious ways, the opposite of what God is asking us to do. It's not about a list. The list is to be a kind of prompt for you. Help give you some criteria. <laughs> so you be like, okay. All right, that's not the exact thing, but it's kind of like that. So maybe I need to kind of do some self inventory and make sure I'm doing some work on the sin within. Is this making sense to anybody? Amen? Now, it's so important for you and I to work on this sin within. It's going to lead to our final point, and then we're going to try to spend some time in prayer. Because when you and I don't address the sin, Within us, that sin within us starts to empower relational sins, the, the sin between us. When you and I don't address the things going on on our inside, our anger, fear, trauma, pain, whatever it is we're talking about, our unwillingness to do God's will to address those dissonant parts of our lives. That sin within us starts to add up to empower 
the structural sin around us. So if you don't deal with your dishonesty, then you will help empower dishonest systems. If you are a predator, then you will feel at home inside a predatory system. Hello, somebody. If you are a racist, a misogynist, a, 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 a hateful person, a warmongerer, your anger, all that stuff is out of control. You will contribute to systems, those very characteristics, listen, that then diminish the dignity and humanity of God's people who have all been created in the image of God. That's why the church, we got we to get ourselves together. Because right now it seems like it really makes no difference if you're a Christian living in the American empire. Because we all just don't go the way the rest of the world is going. I mean, that's, that's a problem. God never sides on the side of the empire. Did you know that? Nor does God side on the side of folk who just, you know, trying to burn everything to the ground. Why would God, who created everything and said it was good, want you to burn it all to the ground? God wants us to be what? Stewards. That's our command. Stewards. Jesus said we're the salt of the earth. You know what salt does? Salt preserves. Salt enriches. Too much salt to kill you now. So tell your neighbor, don't be salty up in here, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Have a little moderation with your saltiness. Mm -hmm. We get all mixed up in what we're called to do. So here's a question. Here's a question. Here's a question. What sin within needs your attention? How is that sin within causing dissonance and misalignment with God's call for your life? And what are you willing to do about it? Again, this is so important because relational sin, the sin between us, it dehumanizes the person and leaves them less than all that God's created them to be. When you don't deal with that sin within us, that, re that sin is transferred to our loved ones. And that sin becomes structuralized. And it sustains powers and systems that snuff out and diminish the beauty of everything that God's created. Some of us got to make some commitments to invite the Holy Spirit in our lives to help us deal with our sin. I mean, you know, I, I, I think we cheat ourselves when we only make the wages of sin, death in the afterlife, and not understand how the wages of sin produces death in this life as well. We gotta, we gotta be free from sin, folks. And 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 my prayer is that. The way we get free from sin is through confession. It's through reflection, accountability, truth telling, relationships with others who are more spiritual than you. If you're, if you're concierge, to use a Godfather term, or your counselor. Knows only what you know. What's the point of having it? If you're only surrounded by people who just agree with everything, yes, yes. Does this stink? No. Do I look great? Yes. Is this wrong? Well, what do you think? You're not around somebody that can tell you, listen, your stuff stinks now. 
stinks to high heaven. You better take care of it. You don't got at least one, two, three people in your life that can tell you the truth. No matter what, you will never overcome the internal struggle and sin in your life. Because you just not, we as human beings, we're not prone to that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing because it's just so comical that we think we could change ourselves. How many know you? I know there's some disciplined, highly disciplined folk in here, but there's only so much you will change on your own. <laughs> only so much you can fix on your own. How many know there's some specialized skill sets that are needed to just keep your body intact? You are God. These people talking about, I am God. God, you know, I am God. I don't need that God because I am God. When you get sick, you sure go to the doctor, God. When your teeth get rotten, you sure go to the dentist, God. When your car breaks down, you sure take to the mechanic, God. So if you God, how come you can't take care of yourself without somebody else's help? God. I know I'm not God. I know God lives in me. Listen. And because God lives in me, I can do God-like things. But your doctrine of God matters. Lord, I'm just all over in this theology thing today because I maybe read a little bit too much this week. But we believe God is three persons in one. There is a community within the triune God, which just means that if I'm going to be like God, I got to live in community. Woo! That felt good to me. But I, I, my time is going to last thing. If you and I are going to overcome this inside, outside, we have to exhibit external displays. So what's happening on the inside? Go back to the beginning. Something on the inside. Working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Holy Ghost on the inside. Working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. People should be able to tell. There's a change. What's happening on the inside should be able to be demonstrated on the outside. So if you are mean, if you are violent, if you're hateful and prejudiced, unrepentant, you rejoice in evil. The Holy Ghost should be helping you work this stuff out on the inside. So you can then demonstrate on the outside evidence that something's at work inside of you. Now, I, you know, we talk about Pentecost a lot this month. The early Pentecostals, at least in the 20th century after Azusa Street, they had these, these terms they called the physical evidence of being filled with the Holy Ghost. You had to speak in other tongues. They took that from Acts 2. Because they realized that in Acts 2, people speaking another language just helped trigger the good news being told so others could understand it. So there were all these physical manifestations in Azusa Street, 1906. People spoke in tongues. People got on instruments and they played without no lessons. People got healed. The racial uh, harmony was, was, was unprecedented. You had white and black and Asian and Latino and natives and all folk. Worshiping together, weeping together, marrying one another in Azusa because the physical manifestation of what was happening on the inside overwhelmed all the barriers and social sins. But there was also this sense that they were resisting the empire of the day as well. And you got to be clear. The early church, now if we look in the book of Acts, they, when they got filled with the Holy Spirit at the end of Acts chapter 2, the scripture says that they held everything in common. Now this, I don't have the time. I'm going to have to come back to this. But they virtually were communitarians at worst and socialists at best. Now I'm y'all, some of y'all, I don't know what their economic model after they were filled with the Holy Spirit 
was to sell everything they had and make sure nobody among them lacked anything. Now, I got to tell you, I got to tell you now, we have not had that kind of outpouring of the Holy Ghost in the United States of America yet. Because y'all like, don't you come up in my house, take off your shoes. You don't stay too long. You see people on the side of the road ask, go get a job. You know the job market is shot. You talk, go get a job. How they gonna go get a job? You don't even have a job. <laughs> or at least you got one, but you underemployed. But you, you ask another folk to do stuff that the system is already oppressing you with. Because you have internalized a way of the world that is antichrist. It is antichrist for all these poor folk to be living in tents. For all us Christians got these homes. It is antichrist for these children to be in orphanages and, 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 and foster homes. While all us Christians are empty nesters. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. It is Antichrist. All us Christians out here serving in. Uh, 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 let's see. How, how, how I'm going to say this. Working for systems that preside over the death of God's people without you being a subversive force to turn that system upside down. I'm just telling you, the, 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 early, the early church sold everything they had, made sure that they, no one lacked anything. They spent daily time in fellowship and prayer. That is very different than the capitalistic American dream. And no wonder the church can't figure out how to show up in this moment. This is a tough word for me, because you know, uh, you spend your whole life wanting things. And God is actually telling us to give things away. What would it profit a man to gain the whole world? And Luke, yo, so could it be that the church has lost our soul? I mean, we, 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 we come into church every Sunday, but our inside game is not in alignment with our outside game. And meanwhile, you got inferior systems. Who's inside game is aligned with their outside game. And they dragging us up and down the court. <laughs> and they dragging us, man. Just getting swept. Every series. Just sweat. Sweat. You know, shacking. They used to sweep folk like that. Imagine them sweep folk like that. Just getting swept. Because when the ball's supposed to go down low, you shooting a three. When the ball's supposed to be shot a three, you fumbling the ball down low. What would it take for us to get our inside game and our outside game aligned? That's the question. I hope these last couple weeks, as we're doing the houses of prayer, that you find you a house of prayer, one of our small groups throughout the week, to at least start the process of reflection and thinking and praying. God, how can I get aligned? How can I listen to all these things? Jay-Z 444. Trump's press conferences. My soaps. My, 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 my ESPN. My Playstations. My, my, my Wii's. My Snapchat, Instagram. How can I listen to all these things and make sure that it is not over, over determined 
the inside outside alignment that is necessary for me to follow the ways of Jesus well in this moment in time. My hope and prayer is that we will open ourselves up to some repentance. Say, God, I need to make some changes. I don't know what your change needs to be. I want you to take seriously the sin within you, the sin around you, the sin beyond you. I want you to take seriously the vertical conversions and the horizontal conversions. I want you to take seriously these ideas and thoughts. And if you don't address and we don't address some of these challenges, they will bleed into our marriages. They'll bleed into our children. They'll bleed into our communities. They'll sustain these systems. They'll keep the church from being what Christ prayed to the Father before he left, that they may be one as we are one. It's a tough, tough task for the American church. But may we at the way in Berkeley and the Bay and beyond start today or yesterday or the weeks prior and the weeks to come to being aligned with the inside and the outside. Let's do it.